Thank you so much, Marcy. Everybody, um, welcome. Welcome to our CCAC meeting. So good to see everyone. And I expect that others will be joining us, but we have a full agenda and I want us to um, start uh, on time because we have um, a great uh, guest speaker who I will uh, introduce and we're talking about executive functioning skills. And as everybody knows, they are so important. They help with our regulation, our decision-making, our organization and so forth. And so important for us as parents to know um, what those skills are as well as how to cultivate those skills uh, in our children. So we're gonna start um, hearing from Ms. Bowman who's going to give us the um, special education department update. And then following that, if Sarah Whalen is here, she wanted a few minutes just to give a legislator uh, update. So Janelle, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our February CCAC meeting. So glad you are here. Just a few updates to share with you about some upcoming events we are having. We always like to extend a thank you to our Board of Education um, members who really um, definitely believe in equity for all students, including those with disabilities. And we appreciate Superintendent House II um, and his leadership for our district. Um, on the next slide, we just wanted to remind everyone uh, to save the dates for our parent, our annual parent empowerment conference that will be held from March 19th through April 20th. Um, we do have our keynote speaker that will address us on March 19th. Um, that's really focused on um, social emotional development with the Winefield Group. Um, so Dr. Christian Eccleston will be joining us, um, who is also a TED Talker. And so if you know anything about TED Talker, you know that they're very, very engaging and really give you um, great information and reflection time to think about the information you receive. So we're so excited uh, to have her join us. Then our second annual Autism Summit will be held on April uh, 20th. Uh, we encourage all of our parents to take the Maryland State Department of Education Parent Involvement Survey. Um, I will tell you that personally, our CCAC board does look at those survey results to really help inform and target our sessions and topics and support uh, for our parents. And so we really encourage you to take the parent survey and fill it out online. And we have it linked here. Um, you can also use your smart device um, to scan the actual QR, QR code that's on the screen. The survey will be available for, uh, through May 24th. And so again, we encourage you to um, take the survey as a parent of a PGCPS student. Um, the other thing that we have that's brand new um, as part of our continued outreach to our families and our students is we have a new um, secondary transition expo that we are um, highlighting this year. And this really helps our families um, complete um, re referrals and application processes with our Maryland labor programs and offerings. We'll have that secondary transition expo from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. at Fairmont Heights High School um, to really help support our families. And that will be on Saturday, May 4th in person. And we have the link for you to be able to join and register. And I think the one thing that we want to emphasize that is never too early to start that process um, and looking at the Development of Disabilities Administration application process, as well as DOORS. Um, again, if your child is identified um, as a student with a disability, um, it's never too early to start uh, those various application processes. Um, the other thing that we have annually is our Special Education College and Career Fair. That will be on April 11th from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at Fairmont Heights High school, please join us to register. We will have a variety of resources and college um, uh, colleagues from admissions around a very a variety of schools that will be with us. So it's a great opportunity for you to learn more, even if your child's in elementary school. Uh, we really target that uh, college and career fair to, to really support um, students with disabilities and to really talk about how the um, entitlement services really stop once the students exits their K-12 education, and that really students um, really have to advocate 
for accommodations and what they may need once they get um, to those college colleges and universities. Um, and then we have our secondary transition, uh, transitioning youth fair. That's an annual event that we do. That will be from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. on April 14th. Um, and you can join and register for them. And then on the next slide, I think there was a question in the chat. Yes, yeah, Sarah would like to know what the difference is between the Transition Expo and the Transitioning Youth Fair. So the secondary, second, secondary Transition Youth Fair really gives you an opportunity to see some of those um, agency partners that are available to students once they exit, whereas the Secondary Transition Expo is really focused on helping plant families complete the DOORS referrals and the DDA applications. And then again, here's my contact information and phone number. If there's any specific questions or concerns you may have, you can always reach me um, at that email address and phone number. So Janie, I'll turn it back to you unless there's any other questions. Any questions for um, Janelle? Any other questions? Let's see. I think that was just, um, Marcy did answer that. Will the slides be linked to the website? And yes. Um, our the CCAC board will post those after our meeting today yeah. to the website. Great. Thank you so much. So excited about um, those opportunities that are uh, coming up to help us uh, think about uh, the transition of our of our children. So very excited about those. And as mentioned, you know, you'll get the information, the slides, we'll post those on, on our CCAC website. So you'll you'll have them. Um, Sarah is here and wanted to give a quick update. So Sarah, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, um, I just thought it would be helpful to go through um, a list of um, the kinds of bills that are um, being considered at the state legislature, um, just so we know what um, what's going on. Some of it I've been trying to forward to the CCAC listserv, but I just wanted to give a quick overview. Um, the, for those of you who don't know, um, the state legislature is in session from January through April, um, and uh, some of the legislation they pass um, can have a big impact on you if you have support of a loved one with a disability. So um, the uh, House Bill 0195 is, um, you know what, I'm going to just share this very crummy looking document. <laughs> oh, I can't. Oh, well, never mind. Um, this crummy looking document that I have that su summarizes everything. But um, there's a bill uh, to create a purple alert program, which is for people with cognitive impairments and not just people with a dementia, which is like the silver alert or children, which is an amber alert. Um, so this is for missing people with cognitive impairments and they're putting together a purple alert program for that. Um, Sarah, this, you, you should be able to share now. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so the second one is this um, House Bill um, 093 and it's cross-filed in the Senate 0797. Um, this one is about um, providing funding for families to be able to access attorneys, advocates, and consultants if they need somebody to help them with their um, special education program and fund. Right now, um, it's... Uh, if you need additional support beyond what's provided by the school system, then um, it's hard to find somebody to support you. And so people who don't have the means to do it sometimes don't get um, the support they need. So that's what that one's about. Um, the next one is about estates and trusts and uh, making it easier uh, to get through the process of um, getting guardianship for a disabled person um, if you need expedited proceedings. Um, and then uh, there's, there's one, that, and this is really more relevant to um, adults who are navigating DDA licensed providers. Um, so I'm not really gonna go into that here. Um, let's see. Then there's a group called Strong Schools Maryland, and they have a whole bunch of different um, legislative things. And um, 
uh, they, they have uh, a bunch of bills here that they're monitoring, some of which they support. And I actually really like this group, Strong Schools Maryland. But the ones I'm most interested in have to do uh, with the blueprint for Maryland's future. Um, so uh, a few years ago, there was a big committee with a lot of really smart people um, who put together a blueprint um, to support students getting public education in Maryland. Uh, and they had a lot of really great ideas, but there is no funding for it. Um, and so they're trying to get funding in place. And so um, so this, this bill, House Bill 1082, um, is just about funding uh, that blueprint for America's future, or for Maryland's future, sorry. And then um, also the Budget Reconciliation and Financing Act, it's, it's relevant to funding for, for this, this um, stuff. There's a bunch of other things here. I'm not going to get into them, um, but there are some interesting things. Um, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll post a link uh, in the chat uh, to, to this information and also to the stuff put out by the ARC, but I just wanted you to be aware of some of the things our legislators are talking about. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. Really appreciate that uh, information. Thank you for sharing. I'm going to now introduce our guest speaker. Um, who is with us, Evan Weinberger, is the CEO of Illuminus LLC, an academic coaching and tutoring company he co-founded with his cousin Wendy in 2016 after a decade of success. What is like growing the sister company he founded in Texas in 2006 called Staying Ahead of the Game LLC. The focus of his award-winning and research-driven program is helping kids build the executive functioning skills they need to be successful in the classroom and beyond. I am so sorry. This is like, I am keep trying to cut it off. The focus of his award-winning and research-driven program is helping kids build the executive functioning skills they need to be successful in the classroom and beyond. The core components include helping students with organization, time management, and influencing the perception of others. As a national speaker, Evan particularly enjoys presenting to parents, counselors, and educators all over the country about the power of executive functioning skills and the most useful ways to assist students of all ages in getting the most out of school and achieving their goals. So he is a great speaker for our topic for tonight, and he's going to give us a presentation, and then we're going to have um, plenty of time for you all to ask your questions. So without further ado, Evan, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Well, thank you for having me and welcome everyone. If, uh, if attendees here and folks who later watch the recording take even one or two tidbits from the platter of suggestions that we're going to talk about tonight, then that's a big success. Um, so thank you all for taking the time. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. So helping students develop critical executive function skills. What is this executive function skills we speak of? So just in the way of introduction, thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, everybody has a lens through which they see the world. And so um, as I get into my presentation, I just want to give you a couple of minutes worth of, of my background. So I grew up in Texas, uh, attended a, a private Jewish school um, most of my life. Um, I was diagnosed pretty early on with attention deficit disorder, ADD, uh, which is now ADHD, primarily in attentive type. Somehow I got that big H hyperactive tacked on in high school. I'll let you all decide by the end if that's true. Um, and I had many accommodations in order to demonstrate, have a fair chance of demonstrating my mastery of knowledge alongside my neurotypical peers all the way through my schooling. And that included not just uh, tests and quizzes and, and kind of assignments in class, but that also included standardized tests. So SAT, ACT, both actually, and then some graduate level exams. Um, I, you wouldn't know it really from my, from my grades in school. My father was a clinical psychologist, so I was uniquely aware of what was going on with me from, from an early age. 
Um, so I know a lot of students who learn a little bit differently um, struggle with some things related to maybe anxiety or some depression or these thoughts of, gosh, I'm just stupid, right? Or I can't do this. Um, and that's awful. I, I won't even call them learning disabilities. I like to call them learning differences because where we, and myself included, are, are actually very, very bright and capable. We just need some accommodations or some assistance and scaffolding along the way in order to demonstrate uh, our mastery of, of whatever it is that we're learning. Um, so that being said, I went, you know, I went through school. Uh, I was interested in clinical psychology, but more specifically, I discovered industrial and organizational psychology, where I spent my time in my doctoral program researching things like polychronicity, which is a fancy word in the primary literature for time management or multitasking, um, impression management, which is a term really from the business literature that has to do with, with how through our behavior we can influence the impressions or perceptions that other people form about us. So we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit in the presentation. Um, and then a little bit about managing, managing stress, but executive coaching was another big component and along the way, I said, you know, my experience is going through school and the resources and kind of support that's out there. I, there's lots of tutoring, traditional tutoring support, math, science, English, history, foreign languages, even standardized test prep. But at the time, and this was almost 20 years ago, nobody was really talking about this executive function skills. We talked about it in, in terms of life skills, but we knew there was this set of skills that that lies at the foundation of kids' success. In other words, every student who's doing well in school, performing well in school, um, is spending time doing these things that I'm gonna mention in a second uh, that you don't specifically get a grade for, right? Things like organization, things like time management, things like planning ahead or understanding the passage of time, um, digital organization, which we'll talk about too, has become increasingly more important um, over the last few years. And so I, I set out almost 20 years ago to start helping students with that, essentially an executive coaching program for students, sure, with learning differences like myself, but even neurotypical kids, um, a lot of students ask us, uh, mom, dad, you know, why am I learning this in school? You know, how is this going to help me build houses or, or invest in the stock market or, um, you know, count people's money at a bank or, you know, how is the rise and fall of the Byzantine Empire relevant to that, right? It's a pretty valid question. Now, I have an answer and we can get to that, you know, in the Q&A, but I would argue that just as important as the subject matter in school are these skills that we learn along the way that we call cumulatively executive function skills. Um, and so let's jump right into it. So we're gonna cover today, first a definition of executive function skills. What are these elusive skills that we're, we're talking about now? How do we define it? Um, why is it important? Why is it important for learning? We'll talk about some executive function facts and myths. Um, we'll talk about some signs of executive dysfunction when students struggle with executive function. Um, we'll talk about, and this is why I believe everybody's everybody's here for this presentation, is some some tips for for parents and and professionals who may be supporting students on things that that families can be doing at home in order to help their students develop these critical, absolutely critical, essential executive function skills. Um, and we'll touch on organization systems. I, I can't do a presentation like this without talking about portals and planners. Uh, that seems to be a hot topic in public schools, private schools, all around the country. I get lots of questions about that. And then keep me honest, but I want to make sure that I try my best to leave some time at the end for questions. And it will be at the end. So if you do have questions along the way, if you're most comfortable, please put those in the chat box. Um, and I think our, our co-host here will, will help me to um, figure out some trends in those questions to make sure we get to as many of them as, as we can. If you feel bold and it's allowed um, at the end, you know, I, I certainly don't mind if you want to unmute yourself and, and actually ask your question. That's totally fine with me. So as promised, let's, let's define executive function skills. So executive function and self-regulation skills are the mental processes that enable us to plan, focus attention, and remember instructions and juggle multiple tasks successfully. So think of that, that air traffic control tower at a busy airport that's managing the departures and arrivals, um, this direction, that direction, this direction, 24 hours a day. I think we can all agree that the cost of failure 
is really, really high, right? It's, it's not good if those planes collide with one another, right? Um, and so that, think of our, our brain. Our brain needs, needs our, an air traffic controller uh, to help with filtering distractions, prioritizing tasks, and then setting and achieving goals and controlling impulses. And then this is really important. And this is why we're here. Executive functioning skills provide critical supports for learning and development. And while we aren't necessarily born with these skills, we are born with the potential to develop them through interaction and practice. And this is a, a definition from the Center on the Developing Child at, at Harvard University, um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So why is executive function so important for learning? Well, it's tied to, and I, I have four bullet points here. It's not exhaustive. There are a lot more, but I picked four that I think are particularly critical. And you could think of this part of the brain in charge of executive function as the CEO of the brain, okay? So it's tied to working memory, which governs our ability to retain information um, over short, specifically short periods of time. Mental flexibility, which helps us sustain and shift attention in response to different demands or apply different rules in different settings, right? So we tell our kids, you can say this at home, but you can't say this to your teacher at school, or you can say this here to me, but you can't say this to grandma, right? Um, so that, that, that little part of the brain that says, oh, I, I have to dress differently. I have to act differently. There are different rules here, right? Um, that's mental flexibility. And then self-control. Um, enables us to set priorities and then resist impulsive actions or, or responses, associated responses. And then self-motivation. This I, I love. It enables us to motivate ourselves without an immediate external consequence, right? If you touch a red hot burner and you get burned, that's an immediate consequence. Um, but if somebody's trying to cross the street and nobody's around uh, and they need some help, if you don't help them, there's not necessarily a consequence associated with that, right? So we have to feel internally motivated to do things. Apply that to schoolwork. There are some things that we need to rework problems. We need to interact with the material a little bit more. You don't necessarily get a grade specifically for that, but, but your desire to succeed, right? And to demonstrate what you know, we need to find that motivation inside ourselves. So executive function is tied to all of these really important things. So I want to. I like to touch on some some facts and myths. So there's something called EFD. If anybody has a mental health background, you may have heard of this executive function disorder. Um, in the DSM five, I believe is where we're at now. Um, there's this is not a recognized disorder. You will not find executive function disorder anywhere in the DSM. Okay, but we know that it's real. And, and it's part of the definition though, executive function struggles or executive dysfunction is part of the very definition of many of the learning differences that we are familiar with, whether it's attention related or dyslexia, dysgraphia, um, et cetera. There's some processing issues that part of the definition or symptoms absolutely involve executive function disorder. So as a result, as professionals, we can evaluate for executive function issues. Um, or executive dysfunction because we can evaluate for those other recognized disorders or differences in the DSM. Um, now, genetics do play a role, okay? We do know that, but we don't know the exact causes of executive function. So parents ask me all the time, is it something I did? You know, did I, did I not breastfeed long enough, right? Did I not, did I not put my Get, buy organic fruits and vegetables and, and put them in a blender and blend them up really fine and pour them into individual ice cube trays and then defrost them one by one. My neighbor did that and, and her child doesn't have any issues. Mine has issues. Should I have done that? Was Is this my fault, right? Take it easy. Give yourself a break. We cannot, we don't know the exact causes. We can't tie it to any of those things. We do know that genetics play a role because if I see a student who's struggling with executive function, oftentimes as I'm speaking with parents, um, I notice it or it comes out that one or both parents struggled um, similarly going through school. And so we do know that there's a genetic role, but we don't know exactly that, that mechanism uh, or other causes. And then this is an interesting point. True executive function issues are present in all areas of life. So if a student is constantly forgetting to bring the right binder or thing or homework to class, right? That same student is likely forgetting his or her soccer jersey or 
uh, you know, baseball glove or whatever it is that that they may be needing. So if, if it is truly an executive function problem, then you should see similar issues, not just in the school setting, but in other arenas as well. And then I'll say this a few more times too, executive function uh, problems can improve with practice. This is absolutely a skill. So, you know, we talk about abilities versus skills. Abilities, you know, we think, oh, you're just, you're born with that, right? I, you're, you're either born and you could do that well, or you can't. And there's not much that you can do to change that, right? That's abilities. Skills are something that if we put a lot of time and effort into improving that, we actually can get better. Um, that's what differentiates, generally speaking, um, abilities versus skills. So if you look back in the primary literature far enough, um, you'll see a term that we're all familiar with, social skills, actually used to be called social ability, if you look back. We thought that those interpersonal skills or the, those interpersonal uh, competencies um, were more of an ability rather than a skill. We used to, we used to think that some folks were just better and more effective at, and more comfortable interacting with other people. Um, at some point in the primary literature, we started referring to it as instead of social ability, social skills, because while some folks do have a, a natural, um, it just seem naturally like they can relate interpersonally with others a little bit better, um, these are absolutely skills that can improve with practice. So just, just an example. So keep in mind these things, we can improve these things. So what are some signs of executive dysfunction? What are some signs that your student might be struggling with executive function? So again, this is not an exhaustive list and some of these things uh, might define children or, or teenagers, right? And so what I, we're really talking about is is several things on this list on a regular basis. So, so keep that in mind. And it's not an exhaustive list, but I pick some of my favorites. So difficulty ordering or prioritizing tasks, absolutely a sign of executive dysfunction. Issues with organizing thoughts and materials, right? So if staring at a screen that not being able to kind of get started or get thoughts together to actually get something down. Um, you're sitting with your homework there, but you know, seem distracted all the time. So just organizing thoughts and materials uh, is a sign of executive dysfunction. Trouble with multi-step instruction. So if you have a student and if you give them a list of two or three things to do, um, they can do it. But all of a sudden, there's you add a fourth or fifth thing and they shut down, right? So trouble with multi-step instructions. Problem switching between activities, another sign of executive dysfunction. Um, so those transitions. Uh, we're moving from this math concept to this project in math that we're working on, or we are shifting for younger students. Um, we're talking about history and now we're talking about, you know, uh, science, right? So those transitions, if students get really hung up on those in those transitions, I'm giving up easily or refusing to try new things. Nope, nope, I, I, I do it this way. And, and I, I'm happy with that. I'm not going to, to do it that way, or I don't want to try that. There's no way that I can do it, you know, et cetera. So giving up easily, refusing to try new things. Overreacting to small or unexpected changes, right? So uh, all of a sudden there's this uh, something going on in one classroom. So you have to learn in a different classroom. And then a student just is completely out of sorts and can't focus and, you know, can't seem to, to think straight, you know, et cetera. So, so just unexpected changes, having huge, big feelings about unexpected changes. Insistence upon doing things a certain way, right? So at some point in math, you know, say in middle school, they may teach you three ways to solve the same problem. And you have to demonstrate that you understand all three ways. It may even specify on a quiz or on a test, solve this using this method. And then it might say now solve the same thing, but using this other method, right? So if, if, if there is a a, a unique resistance uh, to trying things a different way, doing things a different way, that could be a sign of executive dysfunction. Um, repeatedly bringing the wrong things, right? No, no, you're, you bring your blue binder to this class, but consistently bring the white binder, the red binder instead, right? Folder, notebook, whatever it may be. Consistently focusing on unimportant points. That's another sign of executive dysfunction. You sit down with your child, um, you know, and you say, gosh, you know, this is the seventh time that you've done this. Um, remember, um, yesterday you were wearing that yellow shirt and you came in and you yelled at your sister. And I'm not happy about that. Um, you need to ask nicely. Right. And then they, they look at you in the face and they say, oh, 
I wasn't wearing a yellow shirt yesterday. It's like, that's not the point. That's not what we were talking about, right? Um, and so really focusing consistently on unimportant points. Um, and then forgetting instructions quickly, right? Um, different than forgetting multi-step instructions, but, but still another sign of executive dysfunction. So again, not an exhaustive list, but if you have a child um, or, or you teach a child who seems to be struggling consistently in several of these areas, that may be a sign for, hey, let's, let's look into this a little bit further. We might have some executive function struggles. So I don't, I don't want to get too nerdy here, but I do want to talk about brain development for a moment. So where do these executive function stuff, where does that happen in our brains, right? So it actually happens right in the front here, in this, in this frontal lobe, right? This cerebral cortex right here in the front. And so the brain develops from the back here to the front. So guess what? This area that houses our executive decision-making, our executive functions, um, is the last part of our brains to develop, okay? Um, so keep that in mind. What that actually translates to is that we know as parents, we tell our kids all the time, we have more life experience than you. Um, trust mommy, trust daddy when I tell you that, you know, et cetera. But there's actually, there's a reason. Kids, that frontal lobe is still very much developing now, I don't, I don't want to admit this outside of our special group here, okay? Um, but girls do develop it a little bit sooner than boys, okay? Um, so for girls, it's mid to late 20s is when that, that, that front part of the brain that develops last is finally fully developed. Um, for boys, it's, it's late 20s to early 60s. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. It's uh, late 20s to early 30s, okay? Um, so it's a little bit later. But what does that mean? For our students who, who are college bound, which might not be for everybody, but let's say for a moment, if a student is college bound, how old are they when they're going off to college? And I know you can't answer me. So I'm going to say uh, when they go off to college, they're what, 17, 18, maybe some students are 19 years old, uh, four, even if they take five or six years to get through to get through college. So let's let's do that math. So the oldest kids let's say when they go off to college or 19 or turning 19 soon, and let's say they take five years you know, to finish, that's 24, right? That means that it isn't until after the college years, in most cases, that our children are capable of thinking through all the possible outcomes of certain behaviors and that impact the decisions that they make, et cetera. It, to say it even shorter, it means that kids are not capable of making great decisions all the time. That also means if you're a parent who's looking at sending your child off to college sometime in the next few years, and you're concerned that maybe they won't make good decisions all the time, you are your concerns are absolutely valid. They will not make the best decision all the time. We just hope that they make good decisions or good enough decisions most of the time and that when they fall short they learn something from it and they don't get in trouble right and so if you're nervous i you know i know that doesn't make you feel better um but i think that's it's important to talk about the the brain development and where that happens um now um back to what i said before those that checklist of things that are signs of executive dysfunction, we aren't talking about struggling with one or two of those things. We're talking about consistently struggling with, say, a handful of those things. Ah, uh, so here we go. So habits and routines at home. Um, so <laughs> create a consistent workflow to the week and stick to it. Habits and routines, I think, are the, one of the best tools that we have as parents to demonstrate for our children um, what good executive function looks like, right? Habits and routines. You know, I, I joke that, um, you know, even if you have a very forgetful child, when was the last time you got a phone call from school in, say, third period that says, oh, gosh, you know, mom, I, uh, I am so embarrassed here. I, I forgot to put pants on this morning. Right. That doesn't really happen. Right. So what, what does that mean? That means that if some, even the most forgetful people if something is is embedded enough and deeply enough as a habit or as part of a routine, even the most forgetful people don't forget, 
right? Uh, it doesn't always have to do with something that's important or not important. Forgetful people can forget important things. It has to do with creating good habits and routines and then using tools. And we'll talk about the tools too. But habits and routines, I think, are one of the most powerful ways to help kids develop executive function. So as a parent, if you can create a consistent flow to the week as best you can and stick to it, that will help your child develop executive function skills. So what do I mean by that? I mean, I know that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all can't look the same. There's no way. Some of those some of those days kids aren't in school, right? Summers, they're not in school for a couple months, right? Um, and so create a consistent flow to the week. That means that if Mondays and Wednesdays can look similar, great, capture that, do it. And then if Tuesdays and Thursdays need to look a little bit different than Monday and Wednesday, but they can look like one another, Tuesday and Thursday can look similar, then that's a big step in the right direction. And then maybe Friday, um, there's a way to create some consistency where every Friday kind of looks the same. And maybe generally, I know sports schedules, games, family activities might change. So while the activity might be different, maybe there is an every Saturday afternoon activity. And while the activity changes, um, it's every Saturday afternoon, right? So so consistency, consistency. And, and some anecdotal proof to this is if we are in the habit of getting up at a certain time every day, even if you don't have to get up at that time, you know, some random day of the week, you'll likely get up around that time anyway, right? Because we are creatures of habits and routines. Let's use that to our advantage. Keep written checklists of daily responsibilities around the house in strategic places. What do I mean in strategic places? I mean, if there are, here are the three things you do every time you get home. Right. So where would we put that list? We're not going to put it next to a student's bed. We're going to put it on the refrigerator or on the door as they walk into the house from the garage or whatever it may be. Right. Um, if there is a nighttime list, here are the six things you do every night before you go to bed. Right. And you can have fun with this. You can laminate it um, and use an Expo marker and erase it every day. You can make like a custom rip away pad, you know, like that. There are some really wonderful things out there just on on Amazon. Um, if you just search evening routine checklist or something. Like there's some kind of prefab stuff out there, um, but keep written checklists of daily responsibilities. If it's an evening checklist, maybe on the mirror in the in the bathroom um, in their bedroom, you know, where they're brushing their teeth at night, or maybe um, next to the bedpost of their of their bed, you know, and it's uh, brush your teeth, check your planner, pick out your clothes for the next day, etc. And that's a good point too. There are some things you can't pre-brush your teeth for the morning the night before, right? You can't do that. You gotta wait till the morning to brush your teeth. But what you can do is you can pick out your clothes the next day, the night before. You can put all of your stuff back in your backpack and even take your backpack to the door of the garage. You could do that the night before. You don't have to wait till the morning to do that. You can even put that backpack in the car um, so that it's already there, right? So there are some things that you can absolutely do the night before and keep that morning list short if you have a student who seems to function better in the evening than in the morning, right? If it's hard to get out the door, then keep that morning list short. And if, hey, brush your teeth, get in the car, right? You know, get dressed, get in the car. Maybe, maybe that's it in the morning. But keep those checklists around in strategic places. Maintain appropriate positive and negative reinforcement systems. And then that only works really well if you are consistent in enforcing them, okay? So I don't wanna, we could do a whole seminar just about this, but positive reinforcement, you know, it's encouraging things that you want more of, negative reinforcement, discouraging things that you want less of, uh, negative reinforcement, sometimes we associate that with, you know, punishment, which I don't mind, but there's a whole branch of psychology called positive psychology because the positive part is so much more important than the negative part. It has a much more lasting impact. So if you are a parent and you're not proud of how upset you can get sometimes, um, I, I need you to work on that. But I also need you to get even more in the positive direction excited, right? You better be jumping on tables and chairs and pulling out your pom-poms from your cheerleading days many, many years ago when something amazing happens, right? Or steps in the right direction. Um, but that consistency um, of enforcing both is, is really, really important. Uh, modeling. Research still tells us that modeling is the single very best way to ensure learning transfer, right? So whether your kids give you the satisfaction of letting you know that they're watching you and they're listening um, or not, they are, okay? 
Um, boys end up like their dads, girls end up like their moms. You know, we can pick research tells us one or two things and really make an effort to make that different. But, but in general, you know, biology kind of wins out, right? Um, and so uh, modeling productive routines, um, start that, model that for your kids. Um, if there's a rule at home that you can't have cell phones at the table or you can't have iPads during the week or you know something, like that, then don't have your cell phone at the table as a parent, right? It should, some of those rules should apply to everybody and model that, right? It's always stronger. It's not just do as I say, not as I do. That doesn't work as well. It's, it's do as I say and watch what I, what I do, right? Um, because I also do what I say. Um, and so modeling is huge. Model what you want your kids to do. I often give parents' homework. When working with a student, uh, we go into a home, you know, a parent called, we need help with organization, time management, study skills, you know, et cetera. Um, oh, you should see his desk. It's, you can't, I couldn't do any work there. There's no way I can't even see the desk. There's things piled, you know, seven, eight layers high on the desk. There's just, there's no way that anybody could be productive. We need help with organization, right? So I walk in and I walk past what appears to be the study and I look over and guess what I see? I see a desk that looks like it has six, seven, eight layers piled high. And I say, oh, this must be the desk. And they're like, no, no, that's my desk, right? That's mom's desk or that's dad's desk. And so we need to, we need to know as parents that we should model. If we want our kids to keep their rooms clean, then as parents, we should keep our rooms clean. If we want our kids to keep their desks clean and clear of clutter, then we should model that by keeping our desks clean and, and clear of clutter. Um, have a healthy digital diet at home, okay? The world of, of games has changed. You know, when I was a kid, a new game would come out. I'd get really excited. I'd beg my parents for it. Of course, they told me I had to wait for a special occasion. Um, I finally, I'd get the game, and it's all I wanted to do 24-7. And I'd finally, after two or three days of doing it nonstop, I beat the game. And then I lost interest and, and, and so the next game came out and then a special occasion came where I, I was able to get that, right? Uh, games are different now. Now they're online and they don't end anymore. You just conquer more territory or you get more tokens or ribbons or reward or fake money or you know whatever it is. And there's somebody who may or may not even speak your language online somewhere in the world 24 seven who's playing that game and not just somebody but hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of people that are playing that game at the same time. So, and these games, as well as commercials and things now are absolutely created in such a way that it, it lends itself to a stickiness or addiction, right? Um, and so as a blanket statement, every household needs to have a digital diet, which basically means there needs to be parameters or rules around the use of screens, electronics, et cetera. Now, I wish I could tell you, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this. Here's the right way to do it. But unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Um, every kid is wired up differently. Um, you may have different numbers of kids at your house. You, they may be different ages. Um, even across your kids, there may be something you allow your 12-year-old to do, but not your six-year-old. Um, and so be mindful of that. There's not a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, if a child, if you've set some parameters and they've broken those parameters, then maybe they lose some of those privileges. So the same, it's not one size fits all. The same solution is not going to work for every family. And again, this is one of those big topics that you could have an entire, you know, presentation just on that even weekend seminar. So I'm not going to say too much more about it, but just know every home needs to build some parameters around screens and electronics. We call that a digital diet. So just know you should have one. Your counselors at school who are wonderful, um, I know, uh, would be happy to start that conversation with you. And then I'm sure that they have resources to send you if you want to continue that conversation and, and want some more help. Um, but every household needs a digital diet. And recognize effort more than results. That's really, really important. More than results or deliverables in order to encourage the development of a growth mindset. Now you can Google fixed mindset versus growth mindset. You'll find tons and tons of information, another huge topic. But generally speaking, um, a growth mindset is what our little, uh, when we're little babies, we have an infinite growth mindset. We are a hundred percent growth mindset. Um, they 
they think they can walk off, you know, a building and fly, right? So you have to be their secret service. You know, oh, don't, don't, don't hit that. Oh, you're going to bump into that. No, no, don't go near the stairs. You're going to fall down, right? But they want to try anything and everything, right? Put it in their mouths, you know, et cetera. Um, so they have an infinite growth mindset. As kids get older and as we mature, we start to replace portions of that growth mindset with a fixed mindset. Well, in some ways, that's good, right? You're not going to walk off the building anymore when you're older. You can see that's, you know, that's going to lead to this, which obviously doesn't have a good outcome, right? But you, what you want is to maintain as much of that growth mindset, and not all of it, but as much of that growth mindset as possible, because that's what where a student said, approaches a problem and says, ooh, that looks tough. I haven't figured it out yet but just give me a little more time and they get excited and they work extra hard and 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 they they spend a long time put a lot of effort into working through that as opposed to a, a fixed mindset a student would look at that and say nope i've never done that before nope i don't know how to do that uh and they just shut down right so we we do want to latch on and and hang on to as much of that growth mindset as possible, not all of it, but as much of that growth mindset as possible. And one way that you can do that is by recognizing effort. So don't tell students, um, you know, you got this bad grade, I'm really angry with you that you got a bad grade, right? That might be part of how you feel, but that's not really what you mean, right? What you mean is, Joey, I saw what you were doing four or five days leading up to this exam, okay? I saw that. And we talked about it and I told you, instead of doing this, you need to be doing this and you didn't listen, right? And so what happened? You, you did not achieve to the level of your potential. Um, this does not represent your best effort, right? So we're not angry about the grade, we're angry about what the grade represents, right? And so we need to focus our verbiage, we need to focus our language around around effort as opposed to deliverables or, or results. I think and hope that we could all agree as parents that if your child tried really, really, really hard, gave 110% into something, um, they started five days in advance, they met with their teacher, they went to tutorials, they had a study group, they studied by themselves, they let you test them, try to predict what's gonna be on the test, they reworked problems, then they worked it again, they rewrote their notes, you know, and they go into the exam, and they get a 82%, right? You'd be happy with that, right? It's not, a, it's not an A, it's not a B plus, right? It might be a B minus, but that's okay, right? That represents your child's best effort and that's all we want for our children. So don't make it about the grades, the results, the final deliverables, make it about the effort. I see you're putting a lot of effort into that. Wow, you must be really, um, I, you know, I, I really hope that your performance reflects that and that you're happy with it. Oh, you got a great grade, that's wonderful. But what I'm most proud of is how much effort you put into that and guess what? It showed, right? So don't put the emphasis on the grade, put it on the process, on the effort. And then establish a consistent place for completing schoolwork um, that's outside of the bedroom. And I, I'm not gonna say much more right now about that because I have a separate slide to talk about that. But um, in general, we wanna pull kids out of their bedrooms to do work. Nothing good comes from kids doing work in the bedroom. Um, we have been training our children since they were infants to be tired when they are in their rooms and in their beds, when they see a bed, when they're around a bed. Uh, and that's a good thing, right? Um, if kids start doing homework in their or schoolwork in their bedrooms, one of two things are going to happen. Either they're going to get tired, which is what's supposed to happen, and then their recall, retention, you know, short-term, long-term suffers, uh, and it takes them longer. They don't retain as much. Um, the, the work that they produce is lower quality, you know, except whether they realize it or not, right? They don't remember what they read, you know, et cetera. Or the opposite could happen, which is also bad, where students start to, or children start to untrain themselves um, to be tired when they're in their bedroom. And so, so maybe they prove you wrong and they can, they can really get their work done. They can be efficient. They can be productive, but then they go to try to go to sleep and they can't go to sleep, right? So both outcomes are bad. So kids really ideally should be pulled out of their bedrooms. Um, and we'll talk more, more about that in a moment. So those were core suggestions. Here are some additional suggestions. Have specific places for things and use labels to keep things organized. When we talk about our, uh, you know, a, a, a playroom that is all over the place, right? It's really disorganized. 
How do we organize it? We put things back in their place. The problem is when things don't have a place, then things never get organized, right? So we'll come back to that when we talk a little bit about organization, about binders and you know things like that. But in general, uh, take that time at the start of a school year, at the start of a semester, over a break, and really clean out you know, that room and then get, you know, whether it's, you know, Target or Walmart, whatever, grab some bins and a cheap labeler and, or even a piece of masking tape and write on it and create places for things. Here's where all the pens go. Here's where all the pencils go. Here's where scissors are, colored pencils, markers, right? Rulers, whatever it may be, um, have places for things and don't just get stuff for a day, get stuff for the whole semester or the whole school year. Right. That for some reason that, that if you run out of colored pencils, the likelihood of going to the store just to get colored pencils, uh, you know, just seems to go down tremendously. So so try to predict everything you're going to need and get as much as you need. And then some. Um, expose your kids to the things that you do to maintain a functioning household. Right. All of us as parents, we are maintaining a household, household, apartment, you know, whatever it may be in order for it to function. There are things that we have to do on a very regular basis. Well, modeling, it goes back to that modeling. Um, sure, our kids aren't responsible for maintaining a household yet, but they are responsible for um, maintaining their own like lives and organizing themselves for school, you know, et cetera. So if they can see you organizing yourself at home or organizing your week, or um, you'll see later here, setting goals, right? Um, then they're going to say, okay, well, may I, I should set goals, right? And so again, it goes back to kind of that modeling also, but expose your kids to those things. Um, don't strip them of that, of that experience, right? Um, answer questions from your kids meaningfully and thoroughly. Right? I love questions. My wife, not as much, but I love questions. So the kids come and ask me questions all the time. I love why, 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 why? How does that happen? Why is that? I love it. Um, but answer them meaningfully, right? Don't um, try not to be that parent that just gives them the answer. But also don't be that parent that says, I don't know, what do you think? Right? Um, do something in the middle, right? Um, do something where you you say, huh, okay, so that's a great question. Well, um, two weeks ago, I remember this happened and we did this. And then last week I remember this. And then I got a note from here um, that was a good reminder. And so the answer to your question is this, right? So talk through that logic. You're doing it anyway in your head. You're thinking through it, but just speak it to them. And I think you'll find that they'll start asking different kinds of questions and thinking for themselves, which is wonderful. Certainly an important executive function skill. Um, ask your kids to repeat instruction and expectations back to you to check for understanding, okay? So if you ask your child to do something and they don't do it, how do you know what happened, right? It's like a printer. You hit print and it doesn't print. What's wrong? Well, it, you don't really know, right? You don't know what's wrong until you go check it out. Maybe it's out of paper. Maybe it's out of toner, out of ink. Maybe there's a paper jam. Maybe it's unplugged. It's not on Wi-Fi anymore. There could be any number of reasons why the print, but, but the outcome is the same. When you hit print, it doesn't print, right? But you have to go investigate. So similarly, if you find yourself giving students things to do and they're not doing it, one good practice is to, when you give them those instructions, ask them to repeat it back to you. That way you can rule out, well, I know it's not that they didn't hear me because they repeated it back to me. I also know that it's not that they didn't understand it, because they repeated it back to me and explained it, right? So it helps you to narrow down some of the reasons why um, a student or your child might not have done something that you asked them to do, which kind of helps identify some, some important trends to go get tested or retested or see if there might be something else going on or interfering with performance or memory or et cetera. Um, share your own goals with kids and verbalize the steps you're taking to achieve them. Again, modeling and setting goals. Reward steps in the right direction rather than the end product and deliverable. Again, the focus should be on the process. Um, make use of visual timers and keep several around the house. And I forgot to grab mine near me, but it's this wonderful timer um, that has this, when, as you turn it, the company is time timer. And as you turn it, there's no buttons. It's not annoying. It's not a kitchen timer that goes, it's literally you turn it and 
a part, you know, the 15 minutes turns red and that redness goes away as the minutes go away, right? And so it's blessed by a lot of teacher organizations. There's a growing amount of research about these kinds of timers. It helps with, with motivation and with focus. Um, the latest research tells us that we can focus our 100% of our attention on a given task for one minute for every year of age. And this is true all the way up to through adulthood, okay? Um, so that means that a 15 year old who's in ninth grade should be able to set a timer for like 15 minutes at a time and then take a really short break and focus 100% of his or her attention on that singular task at hand for those 15 minutes. And that task doesn't have to be schoolwork. It could be a phone call. Uh, it could be writing a thank you note. Um, it could be calling grandma, right? Um, it, it could be cleaning your closet. I set one for three minutes every night when my kids brush their teeth. I have one in almost every room of my house. So consider using that. Another thing that's interesting about these timers is anxiety and performance have what we call a, a curvilinear relationship with one another. Um, if it were linear, then that means that as we get more anxious, um, we perform better. Well, we know that's not true. So it's it's curvilinear, which means we need a little bit of anxiety in order to perform, but too much anxiety, we can't perform. So no anxiety, we can't perform. Too much anxiety, we can't perform. We need a little bit of anxiety in order to perform optimally. Um, so these visual timers do exactly that. It, it helps prevent students from getting stuck for 30, 40 minutes, even 10, 20 minutes on one problem or one question, you find that they'll circle it and move on, which is what we as educators want them to do. And then ask the teacher, ask a peer, you know, something like that. Um, so wonderful. Highly recommend those timers. And then be your kid's biggest and loudest cheerleader, right? When your kids were really, really, really young, right? And I know some of yours are, I know your parents of elementary, middle school and high school students. But when your students were really young, Remember when they were at that coffee table, right? They're at that coffee table and uh, they weren't walking yet, but they had this big headed idea. This one day they're looking at the edge of the couch, uh, wobbly knees, right? Shaking, said, you know what? Today's the day that I'm gonna try and walk to from the coffee table to the other end of that couch, right? Maybe they look at you, they look back and then they go for it, right? What happened? They took one, two steps, maybe three, and then they fall over, right? They don't make it, they fail. But try to remember how you reacted as a parent, right? You didn't say, oh, Johnny, you idiot. If you would have just waited, you know, three more weeks developmentally, you could have made it all the way to the other end of the couch. Of course not. We don't do that, right? We, we uh, I don't want to age some of us here. We pull out our Rolodex, right? And we call everybody we know. And we take out a camera. We take out our pom-poms. You know, come on, Joseph, you can do it. Do it again, right? We're, we're positive. And so remember, I know it's hard to maintain that that positive role and that positivity as kids get older. You know, now some of them are they get older, they're teenagers, they talk back, they have a mouth on them. But at, at the core, they still need us to be that their biggest and loudest cheerleaders. So I promised I'd come back to the study space. Um, so find a place that's not the bedroom, not too noisy, not too quiet. We want some natural light, good ventilation, strong internet connection, lots of outlets and possibly extension cords in order to plug things in, a printer nearby, school supplies nearby. Um, and you'll see that, oh, here's a time timer, right? So I took this picture. I didn't take this from Google. This is actually my, my co-founder's house. And this is what we set up for um for her son for my cousin and so this is a time timer up here on the left um we see that red part that kind of goes away so the time timer calendar near natural light good ventilation school supplies there's one of those like focus chairs that's cool there's noise canceling headphones um you know screen where you can kind of tuck things away if you don't need the screen and you can work there so this is a great example of what a study space you know can look like in terms of supplies Things that you would think of, certainly pens, pencils, highlighters, erasers, but things you might not think of, hole puncher, stapler, uh, paper, note cards, sticky notes, dry race board, device stand, fidget toys, jump rope, noise canceling headphones, snacks and water bottles. We wanna keep kids in that room even when they take their little brain breaks, we wanna keep them in that room until they finish their work, right? And so if that means having snacks in there, bottles of water, then hey, fantastic, calculator, that visual timer. 
Now, also as promised, I want to talk about organization for a moment, uh, binders and e-binders. So create a place for everything, right? That's a thing, create a place for everything. So at the start of every semester, I like to sit down and talk to students and we'll talk about digital stuff in a moment, but I'm talking about physical stuff. There are still some things that are distributed physically. So binders have gotten smaller, but I think they're still important. Um, so set up a binder and we have these wonderful dividers and then subdividers. So it feels like every class has its own binder. Um, and this is appropriate for say middle school, high school, elementary school, maybe as a parent, you'll put one of these together for those things in the folder that come home that say stay, keep at home or you know this goes back to school your left side right side you know etc so maybe you keep a binder just to again model what good organization looks like for when they get older um but talk about talk to your student about each class um what are all of your classes wonderful should we have one binder or should we split it up into two binders and then you have these subdividers and you separate your notes from your handouts classwork homework labs quizzes tests reviews grammar you know vocabulary etc so talk about the, how each teacher runs his or her class and the kinds of things that are distributed physically and then create a place for those things i haven't met in almost 20 years a kid that says I really love being disorganized, right? They love the idea of being organized, but I also haven't met many kids that are super organized either, <laughs> even though they, they all want it, right? They know that it's valuable. And so I think the key is helping your student at the onset of a semester and school year to actually create a place for things uh, and mindfully, right? Strategically, but create a place for everything. Then it becomes equally easy to throw something in the abyss of your backpack or say the wrong place as it does to put it in the right place, right? Um, and so we use these wonderful colored dividers, uh, you know, follow up with us. We're happy to send you a link that, where you can purchase those things. Uh, there's nothing in it for us. It's just off Amazon. We've uh, put together some of these supplies for you. So if you reach out after here, we're happy to, to provide that. Uh, but you know, color code your dividers and then um, digitally, for let's talk about that. We call that e-binders. So uh, most kids I find are using Google Drive, but it doesn't have to be Google Drive as long as it's cloud-based. You know, the only thing worse than than losing your device to damage, theft, whatever it might be, is losing everything that's important on it, right? So it should be something that's backed up in a cloud. I find most kids are using Google Drive. Um, what a lot of kids don't know, though is you know they they go to docs.google.com and they just create a new document it titles itself untitled 642 right uh, and kind of goes into the abyss of their google drive and they do what they need to do they drag it and turn it in in some dropbox and can't find it ever again um, but what a lot of students don't know is that you can go to drive.google.com and you can still create sheets and docs and, and presentation slides um, all from drive.google.com. But what going to drive.google.com allows you to do is create folders for each class and then subfolders. You can even right click or back click um, in order to change the color of those folders. Um, so maintaining digital organization, that's uh, creating organization in your digital world that's is just as important as the physical world. And now kids need need both. Uh, and then we encourage them name and, and title on everything, whether you think you're turning it in or not, name, date, and title on, on everything. And if it's relevant, even due date, right? And then portals and planners. I want to talk about that for a moment. So this is a seems to be a hot, sometimes sticky topic. Um, I love these portals, school portals. I wish they were around when I was going through school. Great idea, awesome resource, wonderful source of information, fantastic. But there are three functions of a online school portal. One is a calendar where as long as teachers keep it up to date, then you know when quizzes are, tests are, this is due here, this project is due here, this paper's due here, you know, et cetera. So calendar is one feature. Second feature is resources. So a teacher may post a PowerPoint from class or an answer key to a review sheet or you know some extra handouts or, or practice, something like that. So resources. Um, and then thirdly, gradebook. So oftentimes, you know, schools will have grades available 
uh, depending on what level you're at, but uh, in school, elementary, middle school, or high school. But certainly by the time you get to middle school and high school, and oftentimes elementary too, you'll have grades online. You can see what's been turned in, what hasn't been turned in, um, how a student is generally doing. And again, all this is contingent on, on teachers keeping that information up to date. And it's never going to be perfect because there are always things in transition waiting to be graded. It's graded, but it's waiting to be entered, you know, et cetera. But those are the three features and the only three features of the online portals. There is no fourth feature of a planner. And what I really don't like is that students have reacted to these portals by saying, you know what, I don't have to keep a planner anymore. Um, it's done for me. I just, I open the portal. It's all in the portal. That's not exactly true. There's no magic that happens in the portal. It is a resource for information that the teachers um, can edit, but students generally cannot. And so it is not a planner. The purpose of a planner is to plan out when you're going to work on certain things, to break big things down into smaller, more manageable chunks. And so it's it's portal plus planner equals success. Um, one is not a substitute for the other. So students should be dedicating, you know, 10 minutes or so every day to coming home, part of their routine, again, routine, really important, is they sit for 10 minutes, they open up their school portal, then they open up their planner, they make sure that that they've captured everything from the portal, written it down in the planner, okay, and then they go into the planner and they say, all right, this all right, that worksheet 6-7, no big deal. Star the things that are due the next day, no problem. Um, we can do that the night before, right? But maybe there's this project or paper or this packet that they have to do and they need to break that down into smaller pieces and do it in chunks, right? Maybe three, four, five, six, seven different pieces or chunks. You can't do that kind of planning in the portal. The planner is to make a realistic to-do list from day to day um, to help you make sure that you're staying on track to meet all of your all of your deadlines. So if there's a uh, you know a, a, a creative uh, project to break a brochure of your favorite place you ever visited, right? For your uh, language class, Spanish class, right? Um, then you might go to the day before it's due, put a star, say brochure project, right? But then you br I break that down into a handful of steps. And say, I'm going to do this step on Monday. I'm going to do this step on Tuesday. I have a game on Wednesday, so I'm not going to get much done then. I'll do this on Thursday. I'll do this part over the weekend. And then I'll review everything and I'll meet with my teacher during tutorials early in the week. And when it's due on Wednesday, um, I'll be ready to turn it in, right? That magic of creating your to-do list from day to day happens in the planner. And so kids need both a planner and a portal. Um, another kind of interesting way to think about it is portals look identical for if, if two students have the same schedule, same teacher, same school, their portals should look identical. They are accessing the exact same information. Their planners, though, should look very different because each child has their own strengths and weaknesses. This child can do this the night before. This child needs to start a week in advance in order to be successful, right? Um, in that particular class or on that particular assignment. No big deal, um, totally fine, love individual differences, but that's accounted for in a planner. So that's a bit about portals and planners. Happy to answer questions about that. So as promised, I think we worked out perfectly schedule-wise. Here's some contact information. Um, uh, we are very active on social media, um, on Facebook at Illuminos Coaching, and then on Instagram, Illuminos underscore coaching. Um, we're on LinkedIn as well. Um, a lot of the things that we talked about today, we post timely, just free timely tips along the lines of what we discussed today. So keep in touch. Um, and here's a way that you can reach out to us should you have any questions